told that the fourth and fifth graders are allowed to leave at this point in time, <laughs> unless they want to stay and listen to my riveting talk this morning. So. <clears throat> Good morning. So we are in uh, Mark chapter 3, continuing on in chapter 3. Uh, we're going to be starting in verse 7 uh, of chapter 3. Uh, and Keith inspired me this morning, so I'm going to sing this to you. No, actually, I'm actually not going to do that. <laughs> so, um, he told me this morning I'm not allowed to do that. That's a union thing. It's a music union thing, and I'm a speaker, and I'm not allowed to sing. So, but, uh, Anyway, so here we are. Uh, Mark chapter 3, starting in verse 7. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. And he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the, because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. And he went up on the mountain, and he called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach, and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Bonergus, that is, sons of thunder. Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. They went home and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. God's word for God's people this morning. You may be seated. So, uh, when Don sent me this passage, uh, and by the way, uh, my name is Dan Gray. I'm one of the elders here, uh, and um, I, I'm called to, to do this every now and again, and every time I'm called to do it, I say I'm never going to do it again, but then they call me again, and then I say, okay, I'll do it again. So uh, I keep hoping they stop calling. But anyway, you know, <laughs> uh, it's a blessing, uh, a blessing to be here. And uh, so Don had sent me the passage uh, last week that I was going to be preaching on, and so I read through it. And, uh, and so I responded to him, great, just a bunch of places and names. That's awesome. So, um, and I said, well, there, surely there has to be more to it. And so I read some commentaries and did some stuff. And no, it's really just a bunch of places and names. Um, uh, but uh, as we stand for the, the reading of God's word, because it is God's word, uh, there is clearly something in there for us to glean this morning. So uh, we're going to walk, walk through this this morning and, and, and see what God has for us. Uh, and you'll remember as we left, uh, left last week, uh, there's been a lot of conflict, right? Jesus has been kind of going at it with, uh, with the religious rulers, uh, specifically around the idea of the Sabbath. And um, he, he's kind of going at it. And, and as we left last week, you remember the, uh, the, the Jewish rulers, the, the Pharisees were beginning to uh, conspire with the Herodians uh, about how they were going to destroy Jesus because of the things that he was doing and the, and the violations that he was having specifically around the Sabbath. Uh, and so that's kind of where we left off last week. And this passage that we're looking at this morning is really kind of a transition. Uh, it's a transition passage. So we just finished going through, uh, Don was going through this group of uh, pericopes, that he called it. Um, and so we're kind of through those, those group of pericopes, and then we're going to kind of be transitioning. And, and Don, I'm sure, is going to be talking more about that, about this next session, section of Mark that we're going to be rolling into. And uh, kind of a different phase of Jesus' ministry. And it's interesting that this portion of Scripture that we read, uh, as we're kind of reading through it, it might have sounded similar to kind of way back in chapter 1 before we went into that pericope. So it's almost like this little bookend of, of very similar uh, scenes that are happening uh, that we go here this morning. And so it, it, it very much seems like a transition. And uh, so we have in this opening scene where Jesus uh, is withdrawing. Right? We've seen him do this before. We see him, we've seen him do this. So he, he's withdrawing. Very possibly, you know, he knows what's going on with the, with the Pharisees and the Herodians. He knows what's happening, um, and he knows the conflict and all that stuff. And so he withdraws, right, uh, to kind of be, you almost get this picture of maybe kind of moving away from all that. You know, let's all that, let, let all that cool down a little bit. And, and uh, so he takes uh, his disciples, and, and he goes off down to the sea. You know, imagine for a little uh, weekend retreat or, or, or something to, to, to get away from them. Uh, but we read that again, uh, that a huge crowd 
follows him, right? And it says that they're pressing around Jesus. Uh, and it says that the crowd is from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and Tyre, Sidon, beyond the Jordan. Um, and I, there's a map. Um, do we have that map? So um, nobody can probably see that because I can barely see that. So uh, anyway, uh, the funny thing is, is I asked Jacob if, you know, if he had a map, you know, a really cool map. And so, you know, he sent me a map and he's like, no, that was no good. And he's like, don't use that one. And he sent me another one. He's like, no, that was no good. And then he just made his own. Uh, and now we can't even see it. So I appreciate the effort. Uh, I really appreciate the effort. But, but basically what, what you see is these cities, and those are the ones in the, in the yellow, in the yellow, oh, look at that, in the yellow blo- uh, boxes. Um, and really what, what all of these different cities are representing, there's, there's nothing really super special about any of them, but what it's representing is that you see in the middle is where Galilee is, where Jesus is, and the people are coming from the north, and they're coming from the south, and they're coming from the east, and they're coming from the west. People are coming from all over the world to come and to see and to be with Jesus, okay? And again, uh, at the end of chapter 1, uh, there was a, a, a phrase there where it says that people were coming to him from every quarter, right? From the north and the south and the east and the west. Uh, and so we see that illustrated here uh, in these cities that Mark names off of where the people were coming from. So clearly the word is out uh, and the people are coming. And the crowd came because of what they heard that he was doing, right? They heard what he was doing and so they came. And so this crowd is not, uh, is not following him like a disciple, right? This isn't a group of people that are following in behind him, uh, just trying to hang on every word and everything that it is that Jesus says that they can learn from him. No, they're, they're coming to him uh, almost more like a mob chasing him down uh, because they want something, and they heard that he can do it. And so they want something from him, and they want him to do something for them, and so they're chasing him down, and they're going after him. Uh, not to learn from him, but for him to do something for them. And Jesus kind of is, is seeing this crowd coming, and, and he's looking, and he knows what's happening, and they're crashing in on him, uh, and they're crushing in. And, you know, he tells his disciples, hey, this is not going to end well here. Let's, you know, find me a boat, because if we don't kind of get away from this crowd, they're going to they're gonna crush in on me, because they're desperate. Um, and so he asked the disciples to get a boat so he can get in the boat and so he can go offshore a little bit and get some space between the crowd so that he can do what it is he actually came to do, which was to come and to preach the gospel. So that he can give the people what it is that they actually need and not what it is just what they want. And so he asked the disciples to get the boat so he can come and that he can speak to them. And so that's the kind of the, the crowd that we see here. And again, we also see, is very similar going back into chapter 1, we see the unclean spirits making themselves known again. Right? They're falling before Jesus and confessing Jesus to be the Son of Man. And as you read that, you would say, well, that's good, right? This is, these are these confessions. This is something good. But clearly it's not because Jesus silences them. So there's clearly something else going on here. And as I was kind of reading through this, uh, in some of the commentaries, it was talking about this confession is not, is not a declaration of faith by these spirits, but, but rather the, the purpose of calling Jesus' identity out is to try to get control of the situation, is to try to get control of Jesus, to try to neuter him in some way. Um, and I was thinking, I was like, how does that work? And, and, and I was thinking, well, there's like superheroes, right? And they're always trying to keep their identity secret, right? Because if somehow if, if, if uh, you know, if someone finds out that Clark Kent is Superman, then he can't be Superman anymore. I don't really know what all that means. But, but anyway, it's this idea of trying to, Jesus is not ready for this to happen, and he's not looking for them to be the ones to do it. And so they're trying to gain control over him by naming him. And if you think back into the garden, right, when God gave Adam and Eve the dominion over creation, what did he call them to do? What was the first thing that he called them to do? He called them to go and to name everything, right, as evidence of their dominion over the creation. God, God called Adam and Eve to give it all names. And so here we have uh, these evil spirits trying to get control of Jesus, trying to get some type of dominion over him and his message by calling him out by name and naming him. But Jesus really has none of it. He knows what's going on. He knows what's happening, and he just silences them. He just silences them. He demonstrates his ultimate power, his ultimate authority uh, over all things, and he just silences them, and they're quiet. I was thinking about um, 
you, you know, when, when you're a young parent and you have this, uh, this beautiful little child, right, and then all of a sudden this child loses his mind and has this temper tantrum, right? And you're just sitting there going, what? What is this? You know, the kid's on his hand, he's banging his head on the ground and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And it's just like, and, you, and the first time it happens, you freak out, right? And you're just like, okay, okay, whatever you need, just stop doing that, right? And then all of a sudden, as you kind of begin to, to, to grow as a parent, hopefully you realize, wait a minute, this kid's trying to just manipulate and to control the whole situation, you know? And so, you know, eventually, you know, when you get to your third or fourth kid, you know, and, just, and they, they do that whole nonsense, and you're just like, oh, just stop it, you know, because it's not going to go anywhere because I know what you're trying to do, and it has no more power. And so I'm thinking, you know, and looking at these, at these evil spirits, right, kind of in a similar way. But Jesus, right off the bat, knows it and just silences them and just stops it right in his tracks because Jesus is the one with the ultimate authority. Jesus is the one that has the power in the situation. And so uh, it, it's interesting, this, this, that, that little section just ends, right? There's no kind of conclusion to it. It doesn't really say, you know, how it went with Jesus in the boat uh, ministering to the crowds. It just kind of ends and then moves on to a new scene. And we have Jesus sitting up on a, on a mountain, right? Again, you almost probably get a picture of him again. The crowd is getting crazy. It's getting out of hand. So he withdraws again. And he moves out uh, away from the crowd. And he goes up on top, of the, on top of a mountain. He calls it a mountain or hillside. Some, some translations might say hillside. Uh, but he's there, it seems like, this time for a very specific purpose. Uh, and he calls and he summons those he desired. Right? And so this is the call of the king. He's calling those that he desires. And so uh, it's very interesting that he calls the ones that he wants to be with him, and he calls and he, he appoints them as the twelve, and he names them as, as, as the twelve. And uh, there's a real contrast here, and I think Don talked about this a little bit uh, back in the calling of, of um, Peter and, 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 uh, and John and, and, and the others and the fishermen, and, and also maybe with Matthew and the calling of Matthew as well. But typically the way that a, um, uh, a rabbi and a student would come together is that uh, the student would choose the rabbi, right? So the student would choose the rabbi to which that they want to learn from and that they want to follow and they want to grow from. And, um, and then they would be the ones that would kind of take the initiative that they want to choose. And it's so very similar to kind of how a student today would apply for a college, Right? The student decides what college that they want to go to or where it is that they want to study, and that they make application to that college. And um, I'm trying to get this thing to stay on my ear here. Don must have much bigger ears than I do. So, <laughs> but, uh, so it's very similar to how a student would choose a college, right? So they, they make application, and you hear from the college, and, and the student goes to the college that they desire to go to. Um, and so, but this is uh, very different here, where Jesus is the one who's taking initiative, and he's the one that's calling the students to him, um, right? So we read earlier in Mark where Jesus called the brothers, right, to drop their nets and follow him. He's the one that's takes the, taking the initiative here, and it's very different, uh, almost the opposite of how typically a rabbi-student uh, relationship would come together. And, uh, and these 12, right, the 12 that come, they came why did they come? They came at the will of Jesus. It was not of their own choosing or volition. They came because Jesus called them. Okay, it's very simple in the passage. They came because Jesus called them. And then it says he appointed them. And as you read through that, I, I, I was thinking of that word, and as I was kind of studying through it, uh, and a few of the commentators that I read uh, and also there's a couple sermons that I listened to as well, and all of them were kind of in agreement that this, this word appointed isn't necessarily the best translation here. Um, and while the Greek word that's used can be used as a point, uh, but more often it's translated as the word made or created. Uh, it's the same word that would be used in Genesis 1.1, uh, where God, in the beginning God created. Or in the beginning God made. So if you think about it in that sense, we have Jesus made the 12. Jesus made the 12. And so just as the Father made the heavens and the earth, out of nothing he called them through the power of his voice. We have Jesus here who is making the 12. This is the foundation of the church. And he's calling out of a bunch of nobodies, <laughs> and he's calling them to be his 12, calling them to be the foundation of the church. Jesus made the 12. 
and he appointed them and he made them as apostles, uh, right? They have received their identity from him and his call, okay? They're the apostles because he made them the apostles. It's not through their own effort. It's not through their background, right? They are apostles because Jesus made them apostles, not because they earned it, not because they qualified for it. As Don likes to remind us, they were chosen. They are not choice. And so we've talked here about how these 12 were called, and uh, I want to talk a little bit or ask a few more questions uh, of, this, of this text here as we kind of get into these uh, kind of names and places. Let's, uh, let's ask a few more questions. So the first question is, why 12? Why did he call 12? And uh, 12 isn't necessarily an overly popular biblical name, a, a number. Uh, you see it a lot in Scripture, but it's almost always in reference either to the disciples or to the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, and so uh, it's an obvious parallel here that, that Jesus is calling this 12, kind of the parallel is the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, but at this point this, in Israel's history, the, the 12 tribes are basically gone, right? They're not really in existence as 12 tribes anymore. Um, and so God, Jesus is calling the 12 here, and he's calling them from throughout the people of Israel. These 12, these, tw- these 12 men are called together. And what he's doing here, he's not necessarily just, re- he's not reestablishing the nation of Israel amongst these 12 disciples, right? And that's a mistake that we can kind of look at, that he's kind of reestablishing the people. That's not what he's doing here. But what he's doing is he is, he is um, he's establishing actually a new thing a new vessel that would be used to bring the light to the nations. And so if you think that of, of God when he created and called his people and he called the 12 into a nation to be a nation, the goal of them to come and to be the nation was that they were going to be a light to the nations of the world. That was God's goal and his desire for his 12 tribes, this uh, land, this, uh, the nation of the Jews, was that they would be a light unto the world. And so here Jesus is calling the 12 And he's going to use them to establish his church. And his church was going to be the new vessel that he was going to use to bring the light into the nations. And so it's a clear parallel in what Jesus is doing in calling 12 here. And it's a callback to the Old Testament. And even in in Mark's writing, even in the language that's used there, you know, Jesus goes up on the mountainside and he calls the the disciples uh, to himself. Right, very similar to uh, the Old Testament where Moses, right, where God is on the mountain, God calls Moses and Moses to come to him to establish his nation. Uh, so it's a very similar picture, and Mark uses this very familiar language uh, that certainly would have been picked up by, on, on the Jews and, and how that worked. So then who are the 12? Who are these 12 people? And it appears uh, from this text and uh, other texts in the, in, uh, in the Gospels and, and specifically in the Gospel of Mark, uh, that these 12 are being called out from a larger group of disciples. Luke 6 says that he called his disciples and he chose from them 12. Right? So there's a, there's a large group of disciples. And out of that larger group of disciples, Jesus calls the t- these 12 to himself. And those are set apart as the apostles. And we don't really know much about them uh, and actually, many of them aren't mentioned again much after this event. Uh, so we know uh, Peter and Andrew, uh, James and John, those were two sets of brothers, right? They were fishermen. Those are the ones that Jesus called to drop their nets and to come and to follow him. Uh, for, for some reason, uh, uh, James and John were, were called sons of thunder, right? So the, the, there's a, this idea that, that they may have been a kind of fiery, uh, fiery uh, temperaments about them. Matthew, we know, uh, or Levi, was a tax collector, a uh, Roman sympathizing tax collector, and Don talked about him uh, at length a few weeks back. Uh, Simon, if you kind of go down through the list, uh, Simon is referred to as a zealot, right, which is, uh, possibly associates him with a kind of a group of people who are violently opposed to Rome, uh, and anyone that would be a Roman sympathizer. Uh, and there's not total agreement on this, but, but if this actually is true, right? So you have Simon the zealot, and then you have uh, Matthew the tax collector, uh, the Roman sympathizing tax collector, and I imagine that, that they just got along great. 
right from the beginning, and they were probably a lot of fun to be around. Uh, and then finally, last on the list, we have Judas Iscariot, uh, and we know he is the betrayer. And uh, the, the one thing that the, uh, the, the gospel accounts and, and are, are very good about is reminding us all the time that Judas is the betrayer. Um, if almost every time you see his name mentioned, it's usually some uh, negative connotation to it afterwards. Um, so Judas is, is, the, is the betrayer. Uh, and his name is Iscariot. Uh, is possibly um, ties him to a violent order of Jews as well, uh, but they're not totally sure on that. It could be a family name or something. So, uh, so again, so those are the 12, right? Here they are, these guys, and, and we, we honestly don't know a whole lot about them, right? Some of them we learn later on in, through some of their epistles, we learn a little more about them. Uh, but for the most part, we don't really know anything about them. And I think all of this is to illustrate the point that, that you know, these men, they don't really appear to be any type of a league of extraordinary gentlemen, right? They're not any group that you would look at and just say, wow, those 12, they're really going to change the world. They're really going to do something. It doesn't seem like anybody was ever impressed with them uh, as they were traveling throughout uh, during the three years of Jesus' ministry. I looked, there was like several sermons, I looked in this passage of like sermons around this passage, and, and there was multiple ones that were, that were uh, titled The Dirty Dozen, right? So I think that was kind of a, a, a better descriptor of them, uh, the, the Dirty Dozen. And the interesting thing is that like at, at this point, it's not about the twelve, right? I think that's the whole idea, and I think that's what this, this going through this list of people, and they're just listing these names, and there's no great uh, biographies or anything about them. Because it's not about them, but it's about the one who called them. And as you read through the Gospels, you read through the length, and it seems to take them a very long time to realize this point. <laughs> Up until the point of Jesus, uh, uh, to the crucifixion, you know, they're still talking and arguing about who's going to sit in the, in the favored seat, who's going to sit at Jesus' right hand, who's going to rule, who's going to do this. You know, what am I going to get? What's in this for me? And it takes a long time and ultimately the intervention of the Holy Spirit and the resurrection of Jesus for them to finally realize, oh, wait a minute, this is not about us. And as you read through some of, uh, you know, Peter's epistles and, and Paul, who was later named an apostle, and John, they understood this finally, that it wasn't about them, that it's about Jesus. It is about the one who called them, and it's not about them. And so what does this uh, look like that they're being called into? Like, what, what, what's the environment that these 12 people are being called into, these 12 men? And I was just kind of sitting and just thinking about trying to put myself into their, into their shoes a little bit. Uh, what would this be like, right, if you're, you're one of these disciples and you're following Jesus and he calls you out, right, to kind of be in his inner circle, to, to be the ones that are going to be closest to him. Uh, and I imagine it was an incredible amount of excitement. Right, because Jesus was, we just talked about it, people coming from all over the world to see him and to be around him. And you're being called into his inner circle. I mean, there had to be some type of level of excitement around that. And then uh, couple that or, or even expand on that, there's excitement to think that not only is this guy popular, but this man is the one. This is the long-awaited Messiah, the one that we've been waiting for thousands of years for. This is the one, and I'm being called to be in his inner circle. In, uh, in John's account, in uh, John chapter 1, uh, he talks about kind of the, the, the meeting of Jesus. And uh, it says here in John chapter 1, 40 to 45, it says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John, John the Baptist, uh, had said who had followed Jesus. And the first thing that Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, Simon, son of John, you will be called Cephas, which is translated as Peter. And then the next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. And finding Philip, he said, follow me. And then Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. And Philip found Nathanael, and he said, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So there's a, these are the, the disciples are first kind of hearing from Jesus, and they're first beginning to follow him, and they recognize who he is. And so there's this incredible excitement that this is the one that we have been waiting for. This is the one that has been talked about since Moses. 
And we found him. And now, not only have we found him, but he has called us to be in his inner circle. He has called us to be his apostles. I mean, the excitement that must have been around that, the feeling around that. But then along with that excitement, there had to be a lot of uncertainty as well. Even some concern and possibly fear. Because along with everything that's happening and all the excitement in the crowds, there's conflict. And there's conflict specifically with the religious rulers of the time. And this is not a group that you want to end up on the wrong side of, because if you end up on the wrong side of this religious ruler group, you're out. You are out of society. You're cut off from the temple. You could be cut off from your family. You could be on the outside. And so there's got to be a little fear and a little nervous that, hey, we're, we're, we're tying ourselves to this guy, but, but tying ourselves to this guy it could put us out. So with the excitement, there had to be some fear. And then the one thing that, and reading over this again and thinking of it and kind of putting myself in their, in their shoes, that it had to be an incredibly chaotic time as well. Right? Wherever you go, just crowds of people crushing around you, following, crushing around. And, and these aren't just like regular people, right? If you read through that, that passage that we're reading, these are people that are coming with all types of afflictions, right? So you have these people that are coming with all these terrible sicknesses, and they're, and they're crowding around you, right? Don't you love being on an airplane, and the guy behind you just starts coughing, you know? And, uh, you know, so to imagine that, like, multiplied, and all of this is crowding around you, and they're all coughing and sneezing and open wounds and all this stuff, and they're all constantly crowding around you. It had to be an incredibly chaotic scene. Uh, and this one touched me very much because I hate crowds. I hate crowds. My wife and I have had a, uh, the opportunity to, to uh, go to China uh, a few times. And... Um, if you've ever been there, you know, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Or even, even outside, you go outside of the U.S. And, you know, here, here in, this, in the U.S., right, we, we have very kind of orderly things, right? We have lines. And for the most part, people wait in line and they, they take their turn and all that kind of stuff. But you get outside of here and it's not like that, right? We were, we were in the airport and we landed, I think it was in Beijing, and we're getting off the airport, and we're heading to, um, to customs, right? And so there's this massive throng of people, and it's all kind of funneling down into this, like, smaller doorway, right? And so you can imagine, and you're just, like, crammed in there like sardines, you know? And there's just people all around you. And then I'm, like, kind of pushing, and all of a sudden I look, and I look down, and my wife is laying on the ground looking up at me like this. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, what happened? And there's this woman, so the crowd's all going this way, crowding in, all going this way, and there's a woman cutting through this way. And literally straight line, not stopping, not moving, no excuse me. You know, she is just barreling through and just took my wife's legs right out from underneath her, and she's laying on the ground, you know. And it was just like, get me out of here, I want to go home. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and, it, and it continued to be like that. And we, and we, uh, we were traveling in a, with a group of people, and so we would kind of be on a van or a bus or something, wherever you went. And every time you got off that van or bus, there would be a crowd of people around, begging for money, uh, looking to sell you something or, or whatever it is. But it would, they would meet you whoo, right around you when you get off the bus. You know, and it was just literally after like a day or two, it's like, I don't want to leave the hotel. I don't ever want to leave. And so I was thinking about this with, with Jesus and them, and this crowd of people that is constantly around them. It had to be exhausting, right? And, and they try to escape, and they try to go off, but the people would always find them and hunt them down. And so these are the scenes, right? There's excitement that's around them. There's a little fear and, and, and concern because of the conflict, and there's chaos that's going on, and this is what they're being called into. And what is it that they're being called to? What are these 12 being called to? And the thing I love in the, about it is because first and foremost, what they're being called to is that they're being called to be with Jesus. It says he appointed or he made 12 so that they might be with him. They might be with him. Their primary and first call is to just be with Jesus, to walk with him, eat with him, to be taught by him, right? To ask him questions, to hear from him, to watch him, right? How he, how he handled all these different situations. 
You know, Don talked about a few weeks ago in, in the calling of, of Matthew where he said to follow him. Really what he was telling Matthew was to give me your life. This is not a, a typical rabbi student or a typical professor student relationship where, where I'm going to come and you're going to lecture for a couple hours and I'm going to listen and I'm going to take notes. All right, I'm going to get the information that I need and then we're going to go our separate ways. No, this was being with Jesus. That was the call, is to be with me. But they were also being called to be sent out. The passage goes on to say, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. So they were being called to be with Jesus, and then they were being called to be sent out by Jesus to do the things that Jesus was doing. They weren't being called to be Jesus' groupies or his posse or his traveling companions or, or whatever. No, they were being called with the objective that they would be sent out and that they would go and they would do the things that Jesus is doing. And we're going to see this happen uh, in Mark chapter 6. We're going to see Jesus actually send them out. Um, Mark 6, probably in like you know, Halloween or Thanksgiving by the time we get there. But yeah, in Mark 6, we're going to see Jesus send them out. They're being called to be with him, and then they're being called to be sent out. So we've talked about why are the 12, right? Who these 12 were. What was the atmosphere that they're being called into? What were they being actually called to do? And so what's the application here? What, what is it that we can, we can glean so that we don't just read this passage and just say it's just a bunch of names and places? What's the application for us here in this, in this passage? And there's a few things uh, that kind of struck me as I was going through it. And, uh, and again, so while we're not actually called apostles, right? We, we typically in our, in our church here, we don't call ourselves apostles, but all of us who are in Christ have a lot in common with the twelve there and the nature of their call. The nature of their call, the similarities in the nature of our call. And the first one is that we are called. All of us, those of that are in Christ Jesus, have been called. We have been made. Not just appointed, we have been called and we have been made. We have been saved through the initiative of God. He is the one who has taken the step toward us. We did not choose Him. He chose us. Ephesians 2 says that we were dead in our trespasses and our sins, and God made us alive. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. Dead people don't make decisions. God made us alive. So as the, as the disciples, as these 12 were called at the will and the initiative of Jesus, we are called at the will and the initiative of Jesus. Otherwise, we would not come to him. We have been called. And as with the 12, there's nothing remarkable about us. The only thing that makes us special is that we have been chosen by God. Just as the 12, there was nothing remarkable about them. There is nothing remarkable about us. The only thing that makes us special is we've been chosen by God. We are chosen. We are not choice. That Ephesians 2 passage goes on to say that, that it is by grace that we have been saved and not by anything that we have done or could do ourselves. It is by grace that we have been saved. And Paul actually expands on this idea in his letter to the Corinthians. I think I have this passage up. Where he says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and to despise things and the things that are not to nullify things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, our holiness, and our redemption. Amen. Right? There's nothing that we have done. There's nothing that we have to offer 
There's nothing that we have to boast on. It is because of Jesus. And that is the only reason that we were called is because he has called us. We have nothing to offer. We did not earn our way here. And so let's talk about, again, what we are called to. And what we're called to is the same thing that the disciples or the apostles here are called to, is primarily we are called to be with Jesus. And Jesus illustrates this in John 15, right? He's getting ready to go to the cross, and he's, and he's giving final instructions to, to his apostles as he's ready to leave. He's giving them final instructions. And in John 15, verse 4 and 5, he says, Remain in me. Also, I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Our primary call is to remain in him, is to be with Jesus is to be with him. Do our lives reflect that? Psalms talks about, you know, better is one day in your courts than a thousand days elsewhere. Do we believe that? Do we live that in our lives? Do our prayer lives reflect that? How much time in, a, in our prayer lives, I was convicted a while back, how much time in our prayer lives do we spend just being with Jesus, right? In, in, in worship and in adoration, in being with him versus how much time do we spend in supplication, in asking him for things or wanting him to do things? What's that ratio? I know my ratio is way out of whack. I spend a whole lot of time asking for things and looking for things and not near the time of just being still and knowing that he is God. That's our primary call is to be with Jesus because apart from him, we can do nothing. He's the vine and we're the branches. And so the disciples were called to be with him, but they are called to be sent out, and we are called to be sent out. Going back to that Ephesians 2 again, Paul says that we are God's workmanship created for good works that have been prepared for us. It's by grace that we have been saved, right? And we have been saved, and we are God's workmanship to do the things that God has prepared in advance for us to do. You read through the book of James, and he talks all about a saving faith as an active faith, right? Show me your works, and I'll show you your faith. But our going and our doing needs to be in response to our being. We need to be with him, and then we need to go and do the things that he's called us to do. It's a natural outflow of our being with Jesus is our going, And then the final point that I want to make here is about this call that we see in the call of the 12 is around the idea of identity. And so when Jesus called the 12, we talked about how he made them. And he made them, he gave them a new identity. And so from that time forward, they were known as the 12, or they're known as one of the 12. And it's going to be that way all through eternity. And they have this new identity because it's the one that Jesus gave to them. It's this is their identity. This is who you are. I have now made you something new. It's around identity. Who are you? I recently uh, went through a, um, a video and a, a book series with a, with a group of guys and um, it was kind of around a lot of this idea of identity. And so I think that's why this, this point really kind of jumped out of me because it's been something that's kind of been on my mind for, for, for a while uh, and through some different things that I've been reading. And the, um, in this series, the author, he's talking a lot about, um, about identity, but he, shares, he shared kind of this line in that most of us as people uh, are living for our identity and not living from our identity, right? As people, we live for our identity and not from our identity. 
And I was kind of thinking, I was like, how can, how can I illustrate this a little bit? And I was trying to come up with some stuff, and I, I really couldn't come up with anything. So I'm going to share something about my life, be a little vulnerable, and just kind of share a little bit about how this is true and manifests itself in my life. And um, it, it's, around, it's around work. So I don't, I don't do this for a living, <laughs> obviously. So I, uh, I work for one of the large banks in town. And um, I'm in a, a management role there, a supervision leadership role there. And I've been there a while. And uh, the people that, that kind of work closely in my office uh, through times, I've, I've developed this kind of reputation of, of being the guy that has the answers. Right? I've been there a while. And I, I've seen a lot. I know, I know a lot. And so I've kind of developed this relationship as, as the guy that you come to if you can't find the answer, uh, go to Dan and, and he's, he's going to have the answer for you. And, you know, a lot of times when um, uh, there's a new person in the office and someone's walking them around, they stop at my office and they introduce me and they say, oh, if you ever have any questions and you can't find the answer, come, come to Dan. He's the guy with the answers. And um, I got to tell you, there's, there's a certain level of pride, right, that comes with that, you know, and it, it kind of puffs you up a little bit and makes you feel important, makes you feel like you have, have great value uh, that, that you can offer. And so there's a certain level of pride in that. Um, but there's also a certain level of kind of um, angst or anxiety, too, because there's, there's, a, there's a dark and nefarious side of that also. Because the thing is, as people are uh, coming to me and saying that, that this is Dan and he's the one that has the answers, and I kind of laugh and say this, you know, um, I know that it's a lie. I know in the back of my mind and in my heart that it's not true, that I don't have the answers, and actually I have very few answers. But I'm not going to say that because my identity that I like to live for is to be that guy that has the answers. And so when somebody calls me on the phone or somebody comes into my office and they say, I've called all these people, and I've looked here and there, and I can't find the answer to this, or I can't figure out how to do this, so I'm coming to you, right? The emotion is first pride that comes in, and I feel good, and then all of a sudden anxiety and worry and fear come over me, because what if I don't have the answer? What if I can't find the answer? Because if I tell this person, I don't know, I don't have the answer, well, then what is my value? What am I worth? Why am I even here? If I'm not the guy with the answers, and I'm supposed to be the guy with the answers, and I don't have the answers, then what value do I have? What value do I bring? What worth do I have here? And all of a sudden, I'm standing in the middle of the garden, naked, with no fig leaf on, and I'm afraid because I've been exposed. Because I'm putting my identity into this thing and I'm living for this identity. And I can't live up to it. And so if you're thinking about it in your own lives, right, how does this manifest in your own lives? What are some examples or what are some ways? And I guess the thing that I would encourage you to do is what is that thing that you're afraid to lose? What's that thing that you fear will be taken from you? And there's a good chance that that's where your identity is being hidden. The easiest one is around this idea of parenting, right? And, and, and this is uh, fresh with me because my kids are all growing up. You know, and, and you know, when you, you have these children, and, and, and I think this is especially true with moms, um, they pour your life into these children, right? You pour everything that you have into these children, and you begin to take this identity on that, that I'm, uh, you know, Joey's mom. And I do everything for them, and that's who I am. I'm Joey's mom, and, and that's his life. And then one day you're sitting around the dinner table, and you look around, and all of a sudden it's just you and your spouse sitting there, right? And there's no more food to cut up into little pieces, right? There's no more cleaning up, and there's no more high chairs. There's no more any of that stuff. It's all gone, and you look around, and you look at this stranger sitting next to you, you know, and you just say, who am I? Who am I now? And you're standing in the garden and you're naked and you're afraid because you don't know who you are. 
Because that identity, that thing that you have been living for is now gone. But the beautiful thing and the thing that we see in this story is that we don't have to live like this. We don't have to live in that fear. We don't have to have that fear of always chasing these identities that can be taken from us at any moment for any reason. And we don't have to live like that because there was one who came who knew who he was. As a young boy, he knew who he was. He went off missing. His parents couldn't find him, didn't know where they were. They were in a panic, and they show up at the temple, and there he is in the temple, and they're like, what are you doing? And he's like, well, I'm here. Where else would I be? I am my father's child, and I'm in my father's house. Where else would I be? I know who I am. As he enters into the ministry, and he goes off into the desert, and he's being tempted and tempted and tempted over and over again, uh, Satan telling him, if you really are, if you really are, if you really are. And Jesus says, I know who I am. Flee from me. Get away from me. Because I know who I am. And even as he hung on the cross and as he was dying, he cries out, Father, Father, forgive them. He knows who he is. Even as his father is turning his back on him, he knows who he is. He knows that he is his father's son, And because this one has come and because this one has died and spilt his blood so that we can be saved, so that we can be redeemed, and so that we can be called out and called into his family, this Jesus called you and he has made you a new creation. And he has given you a new identity. You are a redeemed child of God, saved and sanctified Peter calls you a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Over and over again, the the epistles say, you're dearly loved children. That is who we are. That is our identity. And that's the identity that we have received from the Father. And that identity can never be taken from us. Because it was given to us by, by the Father. And that is our identity, and it's our identity from here until eternity. And it's not anything that we have earned. It's not anything that we have gained, and it's not anything we have done to achieve. It was just given to us because we were chosen and called, and we have been made new. And we now have a new identity. And that is the identity that we are to live in and that can never be separated, right? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing can take that identity from us. It is ours from now until eternity. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just, um, Lord, this, uh, this passage here, this, 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 uh, this calling of the twelve, the call of the king, God, we just thank you that it's here and it is writing in writing for us. And God, it's easy to brush over and just to kind of read through it. Uh, but Lord, to, to dig into it and, and to see the unique call of the 12 that you have made here is the same unique call that you have made for each one of us that are in Christ. And Lord, we just thank you so much for, for the grace that you have poured on us. God, we were dead in our trespasses and sins and you made us alive and you made us into a new creation and you have given us a new name and you have given us a new identity and that is our identity from now until eternity. And God, may we live from that identity that you have given to us and stop striving to be all of these other things, God, but simply be who it is that you have made us to be. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the call that you have made to call us to yourselves so that we can be with you. You're not some distant uh, 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 deist watchmaker God off in the distance somewhere. No, you're a God who wants to be intimately involved in our lives and you have called us to yourself to be with you. You are the vine and we are the branches, God. Help us to remember to remain in you. And Lord, may all of our doing come out of that remaining in you. Heavenly Father, just speak to us. Uh, May your words penetrate our hearts, Father. God, we give you all the praise and all the glory, God, because we have done nothing. It is all you. 
and you alone are worthy of praise. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.